Hello and welcome back to Corinth Baptist Church Senior Adult Sunday School Class. We're in Singleton, Mississippi. Thank God we've finally begun to start meeting indoors again. It has been a long quarantine, I'm here to tell you. But we're still practicing social distancing at church. and It's not unsafe to come to church. Today is our Sunday school lesson for May the 31st. And we're wrapping up a six lesson set under the broad heading of dealing with messy relationships. Now, I don't know about all of y'all, but it's been quite an eye-opening experience for me in preparing for each of them. So, we've covered so far love, encouragement, forgiveness, service, yielding, and today's lesson is going to cover acceptance. Don't let differences of opinion damage your relationships. It's okay to have differences of opinion. It's healthy and it helps us to grow. The scriptural reference for today's lesson is going to come out of the book of Romans, chapter 14. We're going to deal with verses 1 through 4 and then later verses 13 through 19. Now let's take just a moment to lead up to Paul's need to write to the epistle to the Romans in the first place. On three separate occasions, the leaders in Rome felt the need to rid themselves of the Jewish people. All the way back in 139 BC, Servius Tilius expelled the Jews from Rome. In 1918 AD, Tiberius expelled the Jews as well. And then again in 49 AD, the Emperor Claudius expelled all the Jews from the city of Rome. In each case, the Jews were helping the other Roman citizens to become proselytes into their faith. And this last expulsion wasn't just to get Jewish people out of Jerusalem. It was a cult for the lack of a better way for them to think of it, that followed this Jesus Christ. And Claudius expelled all the Jews out of, out of Rome, trying to get rid of this Christian influence that had started to swell all over the city. Now, it wasn't until the death of Claudius in October of AD 54 that the expelled Jews were allowed to return to their homes in Rome. I mean, they were successful business people. They owned land, they owned businesses, they owned buildings and homes, and they were finally able to come back. But from 49 to 54 AD, the Christian church in Rome was made up of Gentiles because all of the Jewish people had been expelled from the city. The church had grown considerably through these years, and Without the influence of the Jewish Christians, followers of the way had already begun to establish their own unique culture. Christianity had become a major presence in the city of Rome since the late 40s AD. Like most Christians in the ancient world, the Roman Christians were not collected into a single congregation. Instead, they met in small groups of Christ followers that were gathered regularly in house churches to worship, to fellowship, and to study the scriptures together. There were as many as 50,000 Jews living in Rome during Paul's day. 
Now, this would have only been a small percentage of Rome's population at the time because it was inhabited then with about a million people. It was a huge city for the ancient world. And just like the Jewish converts in other cities, like in Corinth and Philippi and Thessalonica, uh, they mostly met together in the synagogues throughout Rome alongside other Jews, in addition to gathering separately in the house churches of the other Christians. Now, so the culture of the Jewish people was quite different from the culture of the Gentiles in worshiping God. Because it's like I said, the Jews, when they came back to Rome, they'd go to synagogue, and then the next day they would go to uh, these house churches. Now, it's important that we note that the... Uh, Jews had been educated about the things of God from their youth. Don't you know how hard it must have been for them to just to now justify their faith? Not by works, but by grace and faith in the deity of Jesus. That goes against everything they were taught all their lives to convert over to Christianity and believe in Jesus Christ. Now, the Roman people, they were pretty tolerant of most religions, but that tolerance was, was limited to religions that were polytheistic, meaning the Romans' authorities didn't care who you worshipped as long as you included, included the emperor among the, your gods and you didn't create problems with the other religious systems. But now, as we both know, as we all know, both the Jewish and the Christian faiths were, faiths were then fiercely monotheistic. Polytheistic means the worship of many gods. Monotheistic, of course, means the, the, the worship of one and only true and living God. And this was a pretty unpopular doctrine uh, that there was only one God, and because they were only worshipped one God, it meant that they refused to acknowledge the emperor as a deity. And this, of course, is why they experienced such harsh persecution in Roman history. As a matter of fact, the church was so hated in the Roman Empire, and Every natural calamity, whether it was a flood, an earthquake, or a drought, it was blamed on the Christians and on their refusal to worship the Roman gods. Even, even Nero, the, the mad emperor, the insane emperor, uh, who had his soldiers to go out and set Rome on fire, when he was questioned, he accused the Christians. But more to the point of this lesson is the fact that the Gentile Christians and the Jewish Christians, because of their forced separation in the late 40s and early 50s, their Christian cultures diverged. They moved apart. Enter Paul's epistle to the Romans in an effort to deal with the tensions that had arisen within the body of Christ in Rome. Whether you believe in full immersion baptism or sprinkling, or whether you believe in lively or reverent worship, or whether you even believe that there's going to be a rapture or not, it's important to understand that we all operate on the revelations given by God to each of us individually and denominationally. We must accept that we have differences and continue to love one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. The entire purpose of this lesson for the la and for the last five before it has been to help us to understand how to deal with messy relationships. According to the fact, I mean, I'm sorry, 
except in the fact that we have differences within the body of Christ and respecting one another is an important step towards that end. Now, the first scriptural reading is Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. Accept anyone who is weak in faith, but don't argue about disputed matters. One person believes he may eat anything, while one who is weak eats only vegetables. One who eats must not look down on one who does not eat. And one who does, who does not eat must not judge one who does, because God has accepted him. Who are you to judge another household's servant? Before his own Lord he stands or falls, and he will stand, because the Lord is able to make him stand. Now, I read that over and over again and let it soak in, and it's powerful teaching. But I'm going to move on. As you know, in the 15th chapter of Matthew, verse 11, Jesus says, Now what goes into the mouth does... What... <laughs> let me start over. Matthew 15, 11 says, this is Jesus speaking, now what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the... And still, I got it. I, I, I'm, re I'm reading it wrong. I'm sorry, folks. I get, I get senior moments, but I'm in a senior class. Jesus says, Not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. Now, with this verse and the story of Peter's vision of the unclean things being lowered down from heaven and God telling him, don't call unclean what he has cleansed, people say that Jesus made all unclean meat clean for us. Right there. The law of Moses concerning which animal meats were clean versus unclean was God telling us which ones were healthy and which ones would cause us harm. Jesus told, told us plainly that he did not come to do away with the law, but to fulfill it. Now, I could go into great detail about why we should not eat rabbit or beaver or swine or catfish, but I'll digress. That's a subject for another day. Paul says it best up in verse 2. Now, he addressed those who were spiritually mature by telling them not to get into arguments with other Christians, especially those of different cultural backgrounds over disputed matters, water baptism versus sprinkling, etc., etc. He tells, He tells us here not to look down on someone that you feel is not as enlightened as you are or as you feel like you are. He goes on to ask each of us, just who do we think we are to judge somebody else's servant? That someone else, it's none other than God himself, the God that created all of us. Of that servant over there, Paul says, before his own Lord, he stands or falls, as do we all. I really love verse 4. Paul declares something that we should especially take to heart. He writes, and he will stand, talking about that servant standing before his Lord, and he will stand because the Lord is able to make him stand. God alone is the one that's able to accept or reject someone from his household of faith because the Lord is able to make him stand. They may have a completely different version of what we call truth, and yet 
they love God with all their heart and with all their soul, with all their might and with all their strength, and they love God. And they believe on Jesus, and they believe that Jesus died, and he was rose from the dead on the third day and left us, and he's coming back, and they're waiting for him just like we are. Do they believe everything the way we believe it? Oh, no. Does that make them lost? Oh, no. I heard a joke one time, and I can't remember it very well, but someone died and went to heaven, and they, his family met him up there, and they took him to the dog track, and they watched the races, and then they went over, and they watched the, do, uh, the, the horse races, and he asked about a group that was sitting over there alone, and he says that he was told, hush, be quiet. Those are Pentecostals. They think they're up here by themselves. We don't know what God is going to save and what God is going to throw into the fire. It's our job to be faithful to the end that we might be counted worthy of life. It's not what we do. It's by the grace of God. But we need to get our, our minds wrapped around that grace. And we need to focus on running the race until he comes back or until we breathe our last breath. And it's important for us to grow and to learn always because nobody's born knowing this stuff. All right. Verses 13 and 14. Therefore, therefore, let us no longer judge one another. Instead, decide never to put a stumbling block or a pitfall in the way of your brother or your sister. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. Still, to someone who considers a thing to be unclean, to that one it is unclean. For if your brother or sister is hurt by what you eat, you are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy by what you eat someone for whom Christ died. Now it becomes obvious to me that we should never let our freedom in the Lord come before our personal relationships. Look, there are times that I want to jump up and down and shout in church. I do, after all, have a Pentecostal background. But Baptist worship, to me, is more reverential. Reverential. It's more reverential than outwardly joyous. Now, I've broken in the dance in the sanctuary. I've leapt up and down for joy. I've shouted and I've even made laps around the pews. I've relinquished control and broken out in tongues, and I've been slain in the Spirit. These things just aren't done in most Protestant congregations. Does that make either school of thought wrong? Nope. I will get off in a little rabbit hole for just a second, though. Um, I've known since I was very young in Christ that the unforgivable sin that man can do is blaspheme the Holy Ghost. And... I used to think it was saying something bad about the Holy Spirit or even denying that the Holy Spirit existed. But over the years, I've come to another understanding. For someone to stand up in church and babble away and then that person or even another person gives the interpretation of those tongues 
and all of it's made up in their heads and none of it come from the Holy Spirit, that's lying on the Holy Spirit. That's lying on the Holy Ghost and that's blaspheming Him. But those servants of God that do such things, they're the ones that's going to have to stand before their Lord. Not us. And we need to understand that what they're doing may be of God. If, we don't have, if we're not spiritually mature enough to discern it, then we've got to take it on faith and go on. Don't sit there and argue about it. Most people in Baptist church wouldn't know what to do if somebody broke out in tongues. They would be astonished, and I can understand why. But remember, before his own Lord, he stands or falls. And he will stand because the Lord is able to make him stand. There's those that are going to get to heaven on the white throne of judgment. And Jesus is going to tell them, even though they spoke in tongues and did all these wonderful works, Jesus didn't know them and to depart from him. That's between them and God, not for us to decide. It's a lot more important for us to, not to place stumbling blocks and pitfalls in front of our brothers and our sisters. If members of our Christian family are hurt or offended by what, by what we eat or do, and we do it anyway, Paul tells us that we're no longer walking according to love. Think about that last verse again. Do not destroy what by what you eat someone for whom Christ died. Do y'all feel these words? If we, by what we eat, what we say, the way we act, or by any other way that we are pursued, perceived by others, that causes a Christian to walk away from Christ, we've destroyed someone for whom Jesus died. Don't know about y'all, but even though we're saved by the grace of God, we'll take great loss before him for causing another soul to be lost. We don't want that. We don't want to be a stumbling block. We'll take those losses by our actions. We've caused them even temporary distress. And by distress, I mean painful, sorrowful, or bitter feelings. The final section of Scripture that we're going to cover tonight is... Romans chapter 14, verses 16 through 19. Therefore, do not let your good be slandered. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and by the Holy Spirit, joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever serves Christ in this way is acceptable to God and receives human approval. So then, let us pursue what promotes peace, and what builds up one another. When Paul writes to them, saying, the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, he's trying to help us understand that these things are external. Jesus came to transform us from the inside out, not from the outside in. Remember, our salvation comes by grace of God, not from anything that we do. Debating things like which foods are acceptable and the like is to miss the point of the gospel. Paul plainly tells us that our goodness, the sure knowledge 
that God lives within us is the very reason we are to guard our good reputation. How? How? By maintaining righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. When we hold these three things dear to our hearts, we will naturally be more concerned about helping others to become more Christ-like. In doing this, we demonstrate that we truly love them. Paul tells us that in cultivating peace, righteousness, and joy in the Holy Spirit by building up new Christians and maintaining a good reputation with others is serving Jesus Christ and the service is acceptable. One of the suggestions in the Live It Out section at the end of our Sunday School lesson is entitled Agree to Disagree. I'm looking for one of those people who clearly sees that the church, the bride of Christ, will be taken out of this world before those seven terrible years of the tribulation begins. I know someone who believes this event will happen. I know someone who believes that this event will happen halfway through that seven year tribulation. And I know somebody else that believes that there won't be a snatching away at all. Both of them love Jesus Christ as much as I do, even more if it's possible. Does the timing of the rapture in any way change anyone's salvation? Nope. Knowing this makes it a lot easier to agree to disagree. Almost every external thing has no bearing on our salvation at all. I can accept that everyone has a different level of understanding. I can accept that I could be wrong or limited in my own understanding of many things that I've always believed in. I have my little world rocked all the time from understanding something in the scripture that had eluded me before, even with familiar scriptures. Learning to, learning to accept that everyone doesn't have the exact same benef- beliefs that I do, and also understanding that they are loving Christ just as I do, as fully as they know how to, is one of the ways we can deal with messy relationships. Except we need to just accept that they are on the same path, whether they're ahead of us or behind us. Your relationships, and more important, your relationships are more important than your opinions. Love Christ by loving the other person more than you love your own rights or opinions. We want to meet in heaven. And I want everybody to be there. The truth is everybody's not going to make it. They're going to be in their own selfish little worlds right up until the day that they have to stand before that white throne of judgment. And I don't want to be in their shoes, and I want as few as possible to be in their shoes. That's why I do this. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this series of Sunday School Lessons that deal with, help us to deal with messy relationships. And I thank you for this lesson, Lord, that you help us to understand how important it is to accept other people who love you and understand that just because we don't all believe it the same way doesn't mean 
that only the right one gets to heaven. You are the master of the servants, and every servant will stand or fall according to you, not according to us. Lord, as we serve you, as we love you, and as we do everything we can to please you because we love you, I pray that our service is acceptable. Let us stand approved by you, O oh Lord. And Lord, please go with us. Help us to get back to whatever normal supposed to be. Help us get these restrictions off of us, Lord, that we can continue to go about your, your business and your work. In the precious name of Jesus, I give you all praise. Amen. I don't know what this coronavirus dance that the puppet masters of this world think that they're making us do. Which way it's going to go. But I firmly believe that before Christians are faced with a choice of taking some kind of tattoo or microchip insertion or RFID tracking, before it comes to the point that we have to refuse to take that and not be able to buy and sell, I believe Jesus will come and take us out of this world. I may be wrong. I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. Only Jesus knows that. But I, heard, I strongly encourage each of us to be watching and to be prayerful because that time may be a lot closer than any of us can imagine. And with that sober note, I will say goodbye. Y'all have a great day, and I'm looking forward to seeing you in church. Bye-bye.